first speaker that we have for this session, um, Sarah Khan from uh, the Baltimore Underground Science Space talking about barcoding Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Um, after that, we have Kristen speaking on biotechnology and carbon removal. And then um, Christo talking about terraformation with Symbio. So this, this, this next series will work just like the last one did where um, you can hold on to the questions till, till the end. And we might have a bit more time for, for Q&A at, uh, at the end of this session. So um, it'd be great to have a really lively discussion. So um, Sarah, if, if, if you're all set, um, pass over the torch to you. Okie dokies. All right, so I'll start screen sharing. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this section of uh, guardianship of ecosystems. If I'm a little hesitant or you see the mouse moving around, it's because I'm trying to see all your faces and the screen at the same time. <laughs> so this project is a collaboration between BUGS, the Baltimore Underground Science Space, IMET, and the National Aquarium. Uh, IMET is part of the University of Maryland and more specifically within that, the Center for Environmental Sciences. My co-host, should anything go wrong, is Andy Johnston. And I realize my camera is not on, so I will start my video. And there we go. And yes, I really do have a portrait of a pin cushion and recording word dish. Okay. So this talk might be a little more, I would say administrative or about how our project works rather than the project itself. However, I will start with a brief description of our project, uh, but I will mostly talk about how we make it work. I've noticed there are community biology projects in my experience that do go on for a very long time or you don't see a lot of progress or some that fizzle out. And I was hoping that maybe others could learn from our experience about what's worked for us. Obviously, every situation is different, but I tried to pick out things that I think would be relatable for most contexts. So, why talk about what makes a project work? So every time I've attended Bio Summit, I will see these amazing projects, but as someone who's never worked in a biology lab, I don't know how to do things like order a reagent or how much that costs, or are you allowed to order it? Like, are the cops gonna come raid your house? So um, I wish I had had a guide on how to start a community project, which I'd previously never done before, and also just the nitty gritty of what it takes to make that happen. So part one, describing our project. So why bother with the harbor? So the Baltimore's Inner Harbor has been the site of heavy industry for at least 100 years, so it is pretty polluted. And there is increasing interest in using it as a recreational space, and people actually do like fish out of it, so the health of the water really does matter for the people who are using it. Um, so no one would disagree or no one would argue against trying to make the harbor nicer. Up until 50 years ago, no one knew that anything was actually living in the harbor. That's how polluted and not see-through it was. And what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to catalyze investigation into the relationship between biodiversity, so what's living in the harbor, um, as well as visually assessing who's living there through video analysis on a monthly basis and relating that to environmental parameters like wind, sun, temperature, from publicly available data sets, as well as pollution. I think what's pretty unique about this project is that it's really well scoped. We're not looking to clean up the harbor because we can't do that. It's been a longstanding institutional issue and I think it would be really overwhelming and kind of have stopped our project before it even happened. And so what we're proposing to do is something a little more feasible, which is to provide the census of what we're finding. Because as far as we know, no one's ever done this before. No one's really studied the inner harbor like this. Okay, so we actually collect our samples near two floating wetlands that the National Aquarium has created. So this is a snapshot of where our samples live, site one and site two, where nice volunteers from National Aquarium and from IMET went out and scraped bio disks. So the bio disc goes in all clear, so it is a pipe with literal discs. And you can see that after spending some time in the water, there's some growth. 
And every month, interns, like the interns on the right, would go scrape the disks and send those same process those samples at IMET or the National Aquarium first for DNA uh, purification, and then send those samples to us. So this is an action shot of young on the left, young B. Lim, myself in the middle, and Tom Burkett on the right on a Saturday morning preparing these samples uh, for PCR. In our project, we are uh, replicating a section of the 18S gene or the COX-1 region. Um, it's approximately 256 base pairs long. We then send off the PCR product for sequencing to Indiana. And then upon receiving the sequence samples, we blast them or we use publicly available database provided through NCBI to figure out what animal that genetic sequence most highly corresponds to. After doing that, we can do phylogenetics and we can do other basic bioinformatics. We can also interpret this data, which we have on a monthly basis for species in light of environmental variables. And if I'm talking too fast or um, if anyone needs adjustment, please let me know in chat because I can't see everyone. So up to date so far, we've generated some data. On the left is a phylogenetic tree without labels. So I'm sure it looks pretty abstract. On the right are some data on publicly available environmental data. In this case, it is dissolved oxygen versus water temperature. But our biggest takeaway from our data so far is that there are a ton of these guys in the harbor all the time, all year. And these are the dark, uh, the false dark muscles. And they're actually really small. They're like the size of your nail. So what does it take to make this project work? First off, the human resources. So not the typical part of your office space, but um, one participation. So we were already acquainted with IMET and the National Aquarium because a professor from IMET had come to actually teach a course at Bugs. And what we proposed to do was to take his course Sorry, I'm checking chat. Okay. Andy Johnson is correcting me that uh, dark false muscles are actually the size and shape of pistachio nuts and not nails. Thank you, Andy. Sorry. Um, so for participation, uh, we were acquainted with these institutions, so we already had a re something resembling a relationship with them. And I think that helped a lot. In, having trust that we could meet their needs. We have weekly meetings and at least one person from each institution attends enthusiastically, which is a huge help. Um, also coming into bugs are people who are interested in learning new skills. So I really didn't know a lot about bioinformatics when I came onto this project. Um, there are other people who, you know, maybe knew a lot about tech, but had never held a pipette before. And so we try to accommodate all those different needs and it's actually been really great because we've, I feel like, been able to take this project farther than we otherwise would have been able to. And furthermore, having people come on a repeat basis, even if it's at least two people who have been there at the same time, at least a few times, um, really helps to build what I call like a core memory so that there's some familiarity without being really clicky, so that there's some confidence that we're all on the same page. More specifically, I think it's really important to have someone who acts as the lab manager. In our case, that is our executive director of bugs, Lisa Shifley, uh, who is the person we consult when something goes wrong with a PCR run and all of our DNA somehow went all over the gel and we don't know how that happened. Or, and secondly, cat herder, which in this case is me. So I send out the weekly emails, I tell people what to do, I try to get people back on track, and usually, what I'm saying is, you guys, I thought we said we weren't gonna do more analyses. So, I'm sorry, I'm checking chat, which is why I'm taking a pause. Okay. <laughs> and I'm gonna stop looking at it because I'm getting easily distracted. So, location, location, location. You saw this image before in the presentation of where I said the sites were. What I think is really important to note is that we are very close to our collaborators. So our collaborators and are the National Aquarium and IMET 
are literally not even one block away from each other and they're directly on the harbor. This puts them at approximately, I believe, less than two miles from where we are to the northeast of these institutions. So we're very close to each other and not just to these collaborating institutions, but to the actual site of interest. And I think it helps a lot with making the issue seem not real, but something we can also touch and see instead of being completely virtual. So non-human resources, as I just stated, location. The location of our collaborators being close by who you saw are very close to each other and at the actual site. Uh, being close to good food, I am a fan of De Pasquale's meatball subs. They are a half mile away, so if you ever come, you should get one. Um, and obviously the physical lab space. And that may seem really obvious, but I just wanted to make it clear, this isn't something that we accomplished out of our garages. So it's not something that we've gotten down to a level where you could do it at home with little to no supervision. Um, this is very much a community effort. The DNA samples we got were provided by the institutions themselves, so we did not collect these samples. Someone else gave them to us. Um, we do have wet lab materials at BUGS that are ordered by Lisa, our executive director, like reagents, pipette tips, what have you. We have a community laptop, which is good for when we are in lab, so someone can do real-time recording. Um, dollars, which all of this involves dollars, but sometimes we do spend a little bit extra to get food for everyone, or we might need to shell out a little bit more money to get fancy water, as I call it. DI water um, and a documentation repository. In this case, we're using Google Drive to store all of our protocols. And so far, it's been really successful. And this is just a snapshot of what our organization for this project looks like. So commitment and momentum are also really critical. Everyone has a different expertise, and this is actually really helpful for troubleshooting. We've run into issues with computers. We've run into issues with um, processing gels and what have you. And I'm really grateful we have everyone we do on this project who has different training and different academic backgrounds. Milestones and obligations. So our collaborators at IMA and the National Aquarium have obligations they also need to meet to their institutions. So they might say, we have an abstract. Uh, could you please contribute to it? And we do that. And right now we're writing a draft paper together and we've asked them, can you please put in this input? Can you please give us some more data? And they've also been very forthcoming about that. So we have a very good relationship and helping each other meet our goals and needs and setting goals for each other for this project as a whole. We also do socialize, which again is important for building camaraderie and for building a sense of community. And I think because we have both a very silly and frank environment, we can have disagreements and resolve them very easily. They're never major, but right now we're writing a paper and of course people have their opinions, but we're really uh, able to work those out. And lastly, I think taking breaks is really important. Um, before I was really hesitant because we're a community project who meets once a week about the kind of dent that taking a break even once a month or one weekend out of four would make. But I think it's actually been incredibly helpful because we all have lives outside of DIY bio. Some of us are visiting our children, attending university. Some of us have family obligations. And it's also a really good way to prevent burnout and to maintain interest in the project. Um, on the left is actually an example of a sample poster that we made with people from IMA and the National Aquarium. Um, Lastly, some issues that we definitely have are, well, one, the good thing is it's easy to work with everyone and we never ever get defeated. I think we have all learned the hard way that research is like two steps forward, one step back. And I think part of the reason why we don't get defeated is because we take these breaks and we help each other troubleshoot. And I think we always feel like that the problem is really finite. Um, for cons, I would say that we are unfortunately, I think like a lot of community biospaces, very dependent on the presence of postgraduate degrees. Um, everyone in our group has at least a master's degree and sometimes someone who doesn't does come in. And that's something that I think we could stand to work on and particularly with recruiting. Uh, 
Okay, I think, oops. So if anyone has any comments or questions for me about this after, um, you can visit our website at Bugs or email Lisa Scheifele. We do have a weekly email that I run and that I do fill with links to things like videos of baby beavers in addition to homework assignments. So yeah, please feel free to reach out. I'm sorry if I took time away from anyone. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah. Really appreciate it. I mean, I, I remember in, uh, the community my, uh, that I was a part of, it was hard figuring out and really remembering the importance of having core knowledge because um, mm -hmm. people do move in and out. And I think it's, I think it's important to mention that that's a part of doing the IOF bio. Mm -hmm. um, so up next, we have Kristen on biotechnology and carbon reading. Hey. Hi. Exciting. Okay, let me make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. Um, and I think this is the correct one. Hang on. Just moving stuff out of the way. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about biotechnology and carbon removal. So um, lots has changed for me in the last year. Uh, last year when I was at BioSummit, I was up on stage talking about Opentrons, still a big fan. It was heartbreaking to leave them, but um, I, I left Opentrons to start working full time on climate change um, and thinking about specifically, what are some places where biotechnology can come uh, into the equation and sort of help us with carbon removal. And one of the first things I need to do when I'm talking about this is talk to you about what I mean by carbon removal. So I'm sure we've all seen the carbon cycle diagram in our biology textbooks. Um, and so we have this, this idea, this is an oversimplified thing, but a lot of the things that have already been talked about, you know, we've talked about indigenous land management, soil ecology, um, mammalian and, and botanical systems, all of this is a part of the carbon cycle, and we usually break this down into two different, two different segments. So there's the short-term or fast carbon cycle and the long-term or slow carbon cycle. We're talking about the short-term carbon cycle. We're talking about what's in the atmosphere. We're talking about ocean uptake, soil uptake, photosynthesis, and animal respiration. When we talk about the long-term or slow carbon cycle, we're talking about geologic time scales, thousands to millions of years. This is where we get sedimentary rock, mineral weathering, and we get our fossils and fossil fuels. And what we've done is we've dumped a whole bunch of extra CO2 um, into the short-term carbon cycle through anthropogenic carbon emissions represented here by factories and vehicles, but the story is a lot bigger than that. So we've basically displaced carbon from the long-term carbon cycle and put it into the short-term carbon cycle. So this is a really great diagram that I did not make. Uh, it's a little confusing until you look at it for a minute, but it's from Project Drawdown. And this shows you that there's actually a, a bigger story to tell in terms of emission sources. So there's part from electricity. There's also part from food, agriculture, and land use, tilling, soil erosion. Industry and transportation are a part of this. Buildings are a part of this. And then there are other energy-related emissions that contribute. Then we have natural sinks, which are land sinks, um, these are our soils and our plants and also our coastal and ocean sinks. About 59% of the carbon that we emit remains in the atmosphere and it stays there for hundreds to thousands of years. This is what's contributing to that number everybody throws around where they're like, oh, we get, you know, 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming before we start getting into these catastrophic feedback loops. These extra emissions are what is contributing to that. So we're emitting about 37 billion tons of extra carbon per year into the atmosphere from long-term carbon sinks into short-term carbon sinks. And so we have, you know, this 59% that remains in the atmosphere. We've got, you know, some estimates say we've got up to a thousand billion tons extra just hanging out up there. And that number is getting bigger the more that we emit. This is the part that I'm talking about when I say carbon removal subtracting carbon from the total cycle. We're not actually subtracting carbon from the total equation. What we're trying to do is remove it from the atmosphere, take it out of that short-term carbon cycle and put it back into the long-term carbon cycle that we pulled it out of. And so 
the whole story is, yes, we have to reduce emissions, but because we've already put so much extra carbon into the short term cycle, we also have to remove carbon. And all of the targets tell us we need to be doing that by 2050. So there are some things we can do. It is not hopeless. Um, there are engineered solutions. That's when we talk about engineered solutions, we're talking about technology. We're talking about direct air capture, um, capturing from air and point sources, converting it into valuable products, um, and accelerated mineral weathering. There are biological solutions, working of forests and farmland to store carbon, ecosystem restoration, which Craig gave a mention to, improve forestry practices, indigenous land management, changes in agricultural practices, et cetera. And then there are hybrid solutions. There's engineered and biological solutions coming together to kind of, um, you know, help help bolster this. And so if we think about all these different pathways and all these different levers we can pull, sometimes we want to know, well, which, what one thing people asked, even Wesley asked it earlier, was like, well, well, what holds the most promise? That depends on your values. So, you know, a lot of, we're, we're grappling with a lot of things here. We're, we're grappling with e economics. We're thinking about society in terms of equity and justice, who gets the wealth, who gets the jobs. And we're thinking about the environment and weighing what are the benefits and risks to ecosystems when we're talking about engineering on geological scales. I'm gonna be focused mostly on biological and hybrid solutions and not on pure technological solutions as part of this talk. And one of the first things I wanna bring in is a term that we heard from Margarita in her panel and a term we heard from Craig, which is biotech. And here tech means traditional ecological knowledge. It is no less technologically advanced than what we usually think about when we think of tech, when we think of technology, um, but it is still important. Oh, I think my screen sharing just went off. Um, let me figure out how to fix that, but I'm gonna keep talking. Okay, so. I can um, see your, uh, oh. So I think what I just had up, can you see my slides? Yeah, is it the biotech berry wastewater aquaculture? Yeah. Yes, it's up. Okay, great. All right, so so the berry wastewater aquaculture of the Bengalese in the East Kolkata wetlands is an amazing example of this. So on the edges of Kolkata, which is home to 15 million people, there's a 12,500 hectare patchwork of channels, berries, and lagoons, which seems natural, but it's actually a vast, very meticulously managed and very carefully constructed indigenous infrastructure that supports the entire city. And it's described as a living and incredibly resilient urban circulatory system. It is synonymously a fishery, a waste management system, an agricultural field, rice paddies, community hub, grazing land. It's also a cultural heritage site. Um, and the technology underpinning this system is the Burry. And this is a vastly oversimplified representation of this, but these are shallow flat bottom fish ponds that are fed by wastewater from Kolkata. The shallow depth allows light to penetrate to the bottom, wind causes oxygenation, and that encourages fish, algae, and plant growth, which is vital to the functioning of the pond systems. There are more than 100 plant species that have been recorded in these wetlands, and the process involves several steps that require really specific and consistent engineering. You've got to prep the ponds, fertilize, stock the fish, harvest, maintain through draining, desilting, tilling, drying, leveling, refilling pond beds. This is a really, really advanced, vast network of, of really critical infrastructure and critical technology. Um, and so some stats on this that make it really exciting. So I said 12,500 uh, 12, hectares of land, 680 million liters of raw sewage per day, which is half the output of Kolkata, goes into these wetlands and gets reformed, feeds these fish. 80,000 people make a living directly or indirectly on these wetlands. It produces 13,000 tons of fish per year, 16,000 tons of rice per year, and 150,000 tons of produce per day. That is sourced locally, which saves millions in transportation costs and reduces emissions. And this, the preservation of these lands forms a natural carbon sink. So this is really, really important. And so this is just one, one project, one really huge project centered around indigenous land management. But through food, agriculture, and land use, we could store an additional 275 gigatons of carbon in the environment. And if you add in increased indigenous land stewardship and land management, 
you get an additional 10 to 20% yield on that number in terms of how much carbon you can move back into the longer term carbon cycle. So this is really important. Now I'm gonna switch and I'm gonna talk about biotech, which is what we usually think about when we say biotechnology. So there are lots and lots of organizations borrowing from nature's toolkit and using bioengineering and synthetic biology to improve it a little bit and make some of the stuff we use every day. Novo Nutrients is making fish food from CO2 emitted from point sources. Pivot Bio is engineering microbes to add to the soil to help with nitrogen fixation and nutrients. Mango Materials is using methanotrophs to create bioplastics, biodegradable bioplastics. And Checker Spot is using algae to make skis. And I could list a bajillion more of these. This is a non-comprehensive list. This is also a non-comprehensive list of all of the different products that we create from biomass feedstocks, primarily from fossil biology, uh, but, but we can make a lot of these from new biomass. And so it helps to frame this in terms of transferring our products, our supply chains from ancient fossilized biology to new biomass. And so this is where some of the technological solutions that I'm most excited about are coming in. And it's really more of a yes, it's like literally all of these things we could think about making with new biomass instead of ancient biomass. Um, and so if we think about industry, that's another 150 gigatons that we could displace from petrochemical supply chains and move into industry. So we're actually talking about some really impactful things that could really move the needle over the next 20 to 30 years. My personal favorite that I like to think about and that I'm working on as part of my entrepreneurship and residence is biomineralization. So the number I like to quote here is that 70,000 gigatons, which is many orders of magnitude more than the actual amount we need to put back into the permanent carbon cycle or the long-term carbon cycle, um, has been moved from the atmosphere into the oceans and then into the lithosphere, into sedimentary rock, by biological organisms through the carbonate cycle. And so my thinking is, well, what if we could borrow some of nature's vast biomineralization toolkit and instead of digging limestone out of the ground from quarries, burning it and emitting a bunch of CO2 from it, what if we could accelerate some natural biomineralization processes that actually pull the CO2 from the air and lock it away into minerals and use it in the built environment. So the one substance on earth that humanity consumes the most is water. The second most consumed substance on earth is cement and concrete for infrastructure, for our roads, our sidewalks, our buildings, our incense burners, you name it. Um, and so this is one of the concepts that I'm playing around with and I would be really excited to talk anybody's ear off about it at any point, but I'm probably running out of time. So. I want to leave you with this, um, and it's the idea that we stand, we're standing at the dawn of a new carbon economy. So instead, our entire economy, you know, if you think about it, has been based on, on carbon. It's been based on biology, but a lot of it has been based on ancient fossil biology. And so if we're thinking about a new carbon economy, for me, this doesn't just mean like a new trillion dollar market. This means how do we reframe, reframe our relationship to the land and to the air and to the water and to each other? How do we think critically about who's going to benefit and how do we make sure that it's not just people like us? It's not the people who have already colonized the atmosphere with their carbon emissions that are going to now go and say, oh, well, we can clean all of this up and we're going to make more money on it and we're going to leave everyone else holding the bag yet again. So. Lots of questions. Hopefully I can dive into some of that with you guys. I don't really have good answers to those questions, but I love talking about this with people. There will be a breakout session centered around whether and how we can build equitable climate solutions, how capitalism plays with that or doesn't. And yeah, you're right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks so much for sharing just so much about our climate and our and, and 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 the carbon cycle. It's really inspiring to see that there's so many active efforts in place right now um, to try and mitigate some of these some of these harms, dangers. Um, and you know, in that in that vein, um, we have Tavia up next, talking about how or asking the question whether genetic altering or micro evolving microbes could be a solution to to climate change. So, uh, Tavia, if you're if you're on deck. 
Yeah. Pass the mic over to you. Hi, so uh, my name is Bayabar Ticker Short. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides real quick. All right. Uh, can you guys see it? Yes. Sorry, it's just taking a second. Look. Okay, so uh, today I want to talk about can you genetically alter or micro evolve microbes to be the solution to climate change? So as we all know, climate change is obviously a major issue and it's something that we need to take seriously within the next few years if we do want to stop this death sentence that we have on top of us. So when people think of microbes, it's such a small yet such a vital important like component for everything that happens on the earth. So fun fact, microbes can not only help solve pollution, but they also cause a lot of global warming. For example, in the photo that you see right there, um, that is actually algae, which is found on Arctic ice, and it's actually making the um, Arctic ice melt faster, right? And it's holding in the heat. So microbes, if we don't use them for our advantage, they can actually be counterproductive. So this is where bioremediation comes in. So bioremediation is to use naturally occurring or induced microorganisms, um, which can be anything from algae to fungi to uh, bacteria, et cetera, et cetera, even plants in some cases, and use them to like break down environmental pollutants. So in this case, I'm gonna go through some examples of ways that uh, different microorganisms have been used to help combat like different types of global warming issues and pollution causes. And then I'm gonna go and talk a little about my own project. Gotta keep it quick, don't wanna go over my time. So current known examples. For example, there have been um, different bacteria uh, that have been able to successfully uh, degrade acidic mining waste and plastic, specifically low density polyethylene, which is more like plastic bags, um, there have been some fungi that have been shown to break down uh, plastic water bottles. Um, so that's like Aspergillus niger. niger. Um, and then we have, uh, you can break down natural nitrogen and you can produce natural nitrogen and phosphorus supplies for plants. So that's something which I personally think should be incorporated more um, over using harsher chemicals that will then go into uh, water supplies for like nearby villages and towns, you could just use a naturally occurring fungi and it's a uh, partnership relationship with the plants. So that allows the plants to get what they need. And in return, um, the fungi gets supplied with glucose from the plants. So a few more examples, um, crude oil, which is we deem as a very hard component to break down. There have been bacteria, and especially recently in 2019, there was a lot of research done in this. Um, there are bacteria that can break this down um, and it completely decomposes it. And in return, there are no toxic chemicals that are released. Um, this was actually used for uh, some of the cleanup done in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then obviously formaldehyde, um, which is another toxic chemical, which there is bacteria that can consume it. So where am I going with all of this? A lot of research has been done in lab situations, right? There's been studies that have been done. You can do it in small petri dishes, et cetera, et cetera. And that's great. It's great that we're doing research, but none of that has been applicable on a more industrial level. Everything that we can do works great in small scales, but if we wanna bring this into a applicable solution that governments take or even other companies can start off on, this has to be able to be replicated and it has to be cost efficient. And this is where there needs, in my opinion, needs to be a little more push for creating industrially more efficient methods, uh, specifically with bio, uh, bioreactors and also the combination of using different bacterias or using different fungi. Um, so in nature, obviously, when you look at a fungi, it rarely acts on its own. Some things such as a termite, right? Termites are known for decomposing wood, which is a type of cellulose. Um, the, the termite itself isn't doing much of the decomposing. It's actually a um, enzyme, well, it's a bacteria within its gut, which produces an enzyme called cellulase. That's doing all the decomposing. But 
studies have shown when you remove that enzyme, when you remove that bacteria from the termite itself, it doesn't function. It actually will not decompose the wood as efficiently as when it is within the termite. So there has to be a push of understanding how these bacteria and how these fungi or how these different organisms are correlated and how to produce the most efficient issue, there has to be some sort of biomimicry that's done. You cannot take a organism that's living in nature and just isolate it completely and hope that it produces the same result. So that's actually something I'm doing within my own research. So I actually started a lab at home um, and with a few friends, I decided like, hey, I want to target textile pollution. What exactly is textile pollution? This is everything from pre-consumer to post-consumer waste. So we're looking at dye waste. We're looking at um, actual clothing that's thrown into landfills. And the current modern solution for that, for a lot of companies and such as like H&M, especially fast fashion companies, is that they don't want to give their clothes out for free. There is, so they'll either use burning methods, which is burn to energy. So you'll burn it and then produce energy from it. But that releases a lot of very toxic fumes, right? So you're looking at methane, you're looking at CO2, as well as when you burn the actual dyes treatments, those release more toxic fumes. And it's shown to be a carcinogen. It's shown to uh, create cancer and other lung problems. So that's obviously not a good method. The other method is just throw it in a landfill. It's cellulose, right? So it should decompose. Yes, in theory, yes, that is true. But when you put it in a landfill itself, you aren't giving, it's not an aerodynamic situation. So there's no oxygen reaching the clothes. And for proper decomposition, it, there needs to be oxygen when cellulose, de cellulose decomposes. So you're looking at cotton, you're looking at silk, et cetera. And when you take out the ex uh, oxygen or access to oxygen, a large amount of methane is produced. So people who live by landfills already have a decreased quality of health, as well as you're harming the environment. The textile industry is actually the second biggest pollutant worldwide. So that already says a lot. So what we decided to do is like, hey, what if we could use different types of microbes and create an actual system where these microbes would be working together, right, rather than individually? So the way we've set it up is these microbes are exposed to the clothing, different parts of the clothing. So we would strip them of the dyes, those dyes would be exposed to um, the own set of uh, chemicals that you need and then on and on. And then we're using everything from Aspergillus niger, we're using uh, fluorid fungi as well as algae. Uh, at the end, we are able to successfully decompose the toxic treatments as well as create byproducts such as biomatter using biofuels and ethanol glyco, which is used in antifreeze. So I am actually up of time. So if you guys are interested in being part of this project or just like connecting, this is my contact information. You can contact me by email or you can search up my name on LinkedIn or Facebook. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Thanks for, for, for sharing your work. Um, Tabi, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, so up next, we have Christo with Terraformationist in Bio. Um, it looks like we're running about five minutes behind. So um, if it's all right with, with you guys, we might go till 4.45, take five minutes from break. Um, and then we'll make sure to have enough time for a five minute Q and A with everyone at the end. Um, could you just give me a thumbs up if that sounds good or a thumbs down if that sounds, sounds not good? Cool. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. So, uh, Christo, you're, you're on deck. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me share. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Garcia and I am the leader of BioNest, the, the biohacker space of the Innovation Park Agrobiotech. And firstly, uh, I want to, to say thanks. Thanks all, all of you and thanks for the team that make this, this summit possible. And uh, this summit that we are Just checking in. Yeah, right. this, this biohacker space. And I am the engineer of biotechnology. And I don't have internet. 
Excuse me. So, so, so Chris, okay. Chris, you could you could try shutting off your video, and maybe that'll okay. save some of your bandwidth, and we can just have have your 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 voice over your slides. Okay. This is right. And just said And there, uh, okay, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, in this in this uh, time, uh, I, I I want to start uh, talking about what is life. Uh, what is life is a relevant question that is um, is made for the humanity. Uh, philosophers wondering in early stage uh, of humanity how the life begins. And this question was pressing through generations, uh, arriving to scientists that looking for an answer, applying uh, the, scientific, the scientific method. Uh, one of the, these scientists uh, that wonders about this was Erwin Schrodinger, that in 1944 published his book, What is Life? And this book contains a complete of ideas and that Schrodinger with his critical physicist I put in paper. And one of the conclusions of his works uh, was that should be a molecule with the capability of storage and information about how to construct an organism uh, with the capability of not only storage information, also transmitted to the next generations. Uh, this work inspired uh, several uh, brilliant minds that start to looking for the molecule, uh, the key of the life. And then uh, several group of scientists uh, around the world, between there, Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins and Watson and Crick, uh, participating in this in this uh, search. And all knows how how this episode ends. Watson and Crick find the structure that exhibits stability and match with the imagines that Franklin obtained in his laboratory. And it's important to say that Rosalind Franklin was a incredible scientist with a big abilities on crystallography that be able to here find the decay uh, of imagines. And what is life? Uh, a biochemistry uh, probably will say that it's a network of chemical reactions that the cell doing to maintain its stable state and a state that violates the fundamental laws of the nature to the central entropy uh, as shown in the rights in, in any time. Uh, well, when the molecule was discovered, a novel big question emerged. What are the way in that uh, this molecule transferred information to the next generation? What was the code? And then when discovered the way on how the information was transferred, uh, calling the central dogma of molecular biology that indicates all the, uh, these three uh, general steps, transcription to obtain RNA from DNA and translation to obtain uh, proteins from, his, from these chains of, chains of RNA. Uh, all these molecules, these, these two steps are uh, the origin for the life as we know in, in Earth. But what are about other planets? It's possible to find uh, or develop life in, in the space. We can engineer this, this space. Uh, so for the life it can be possible, it's important the presence of three elements or, or three K, K aspects. Uh, liquid water, liquid water that has uh, several special features that makes possible the possibility of the, the life and make it possible that chemical reaction occurs and that the metabolic uh, metabolic pathway works. All of this is possible that the other water is the universal dissolvent and this is important for the exchange and the flow of molecules into uh, and out of the cells. And another factor that is important is the presence of the fundamental breaks, uh, carbon, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, that we know that all of these are important for the formation of several biomolecules that makes uh, possible the maintenance of the life, proteins, carbs, uh, lipids, and the nucleic acids. Uh, and another key, key factor is the energy source that make it possible possible uh, feeding the cells with the with the energy that we that they need to to doing the the processes possible. So uh, the terraforming process, uh, what what implies uh, the terraforming processes? How we can do another planets contain all these features? We need to do the, the environment uh, on these places experiment a change, a global change. And one thing that is very important to consider is that the environment could be transformed to obtain features with similar use uh, of the hair. Uh, but it's probably that we can obtain the same conditions, condition like gravity. I'm sorry for the noise. <laughs> it's, a, 
it's in my in my place. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, these conditions like gravity and the duration of days and, day and nights as the year, uh, we can change it. Um, these are very important for the biological cycles on life organisms. Uh, we can imagine uh, three big, big steps to doing terraformation. Uh, the terraformation in seed. Uh, this, this terraformation, we, we, can, we can think about, about this like uh, the processes that we, we can be possible that the, the life is, is occurring in, in other places. And Kerr Sagan uh, also suggests uh, the use of dark plants capable to, to growing in the polar snows and can, and can possibly uh, make, make the conditions uh, for, for the probability of life. Uh, this was, was a, a topic that they, they think in, in his era. And development and the development of the synthetic biology as an engineering avenue for modifying the cells to perform novel functionalities. This uh, is an area that promises the, the modification of living systems in ways that could overcome the design limitations resulting from evolutionary trade offs. Uh, look, the, this could, could be uh, engineering mod, mod, microorganisms that be the key of the pra, planetary uh, terraformation. Uh, so, uh, the the key uh, or the the idea central uh, in this in this uh, sheet is that the life finds a way uh, and life finds a way be because uh, in the the life uh, develop and uh, novel novel uh, systems novel pathways that that make possible uh, his adaptation on, on the places and the and the in there are growing and. Uh, uh, the ecosystems and the planetary ecology is an important uh, area that are growing out in, in this moment. And Richard Feynman said uh, in one time that the plants and the trees are extraterrestrial uh, because uh, they not need oxygen to survive. And the organisms that have a molecular mechanisms to maintain homeostasis and with the environment uh, uh, make it possible. Uh, um, to, to growing up in, in, in extreme uh, in extreme co conditions, um, they they responses to stimulus uh, stimulus and the cases of study closest to Mars that we are uh, assaying in, in, in Earth today uh, are for example dry valleys in Antarctica, the Deep Valley in California, the Diamond Island in Canada that are places that uh, could be closest to, to the environmental conditions of, of Mars. And another another uh, key in, in these uh, processes is the synthetic biology. Uh, throughout, we can uh, make genetic engineering that can be used to assemble novel or more efficient uh, metabolic pathways that per permit that allows allows you uh, the gradative and biosynthetic pathways. And uh, but and uh, this um, this topic is very interesting. With the we, we talk about uh, the the integrated circuits approach uh, or molecular switches. That the the key idea is is to is design design the uh, constructions. That, Mr. Ball, uh, just heads up. We're almost at time. Okay. For 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 Q and A. Okay, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. <laughs> All right, so um, now it's time for our Q and A. So we've heard a wide variety of speakers from from terraformation to uh, barcoding Baltimore's inner harbor, and there's been some some questions in in in, in the chat. Um, so because we're I think we we, we talked about this earlier, but um, we'll just uh, allow folks to unmute themselves and then give questions. Um, so uh, we'll be looking through the participants list too. If, if, if anyone has has texted a message or, or a question, um, looks like uh, Guy has a barcoding question. Guy, do you want to unmute and ask it? I can. I wonder why you call it Guy because I'm in, I'm in Paris, huh? okay. Um, so the barcoding, I'm wondering a few different things. So if you do the sample prep yourself, and I know there's been a lot of stuff of like doing barcoding with high school students and things like that. Have you thought about like somehow expanding it or doing an educational thing or with people who are coming to the aquarium or I don't know, getting somehow getting more people involved? 
Yeah, we've definitely tried to recruit through um, outreach events, but we could definitely stand to expand to high school students. Um, something that we have been thinking about and we've been talking about is the fact that we don't really reflect what Baltimore looks like, and so we would like to. And the, the, the sample prep, do you do it yourselves? Do, how do you do extraction? Okay, so with the aquarium and the IMET team, what they do is they get the DNA, they do the DNA extraction themselves, and then they hand us the DNA samples for us to PCR with, um, we have, a, I think it makes for a total of 64 different combinations of primers. And so we have an eight by eight grid of primers that we use. And then, so you, that and then you run and easy. then you run sixty four gels to see what actually was um, amplified. At least sixty four wells. So we had over we had something like one hundred twenty samples, and we probably ran them in triplicate. Okay. So that took a while. Okay. Cool. Thanks. No problem. Oh, uh, Young B did add that we do check the DNA concentrations when we do get the samples from IMET. And, and how do they do the extractions? Do you know? Um, we do have the information in our paper. I think they use the Keogen prep kit, but I can look that up and send that to you later. And I, I think I, I recall that maybe at a previous bio summit, you had a, a DNA detective workshop. Yes. Ah, getting some ideas. Uh, kind, kind, no, I, I've, I've read a lot about like DNA barcoding and stuff and how to do like educational stuff and work with high school students and how to get them engaged. And I think my think is a little simpler. Like I have a kit that detects GMOs and food, and it's kind of the first how to pipette, how to seed genes, how to interact with them, kind of thing. And I think this could be a way to build on top of it. Very neat, very neat. Um, it looks like uh, Craig has a question too. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> on the route of um, you know perspectives of uh, carbon sequestration and bioremediation, it's really interesting because we're looking for environments to you know prospect the means to break down con anthropogenic contaminants. Uh, and even model locations to mimic where you might find extra texture life. The one sector I think is really interesting because we're kind of biased since we're living, feeding off the energy gradient of the sun is like the actual, the deep ecology, um, the subverse. So back in 2018, the deep carbon observatory realized that like, oh, wow, there's like this absurd amount of biomass. So like in the, quadri in the quint quintri quintrillions, like 15 to 23 billion tons of carbon mass and microbes living underneath the earth and these are the lithotropes that have like lifespans that are like on geological time scales because i think the best source for us of breaking down the most recalcitrant or even mimicking a lot of those have you had looked into those at all or thought, thought about because part of it is too is like where do you even start because the people that study them like we can mimic the creations but like turns out their lifespans are longer than ours because they're just used to these geological time scales and that's that's a great question i just want to say that um uh so we're into break right now. So feel free to stick around. Um, we'll be coming out of break at um, 4.55. Um, remember there's the conversation still going on on Slack. Um, and um, for those who, 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 who still have questions and Craig will hope, hope, hope to get an answer to you right after I finish, um, feel free to add me to the chat or message the folks you want to chat with directly. Um, but for those who don't have questions, feel free to go and come back at uh, 4.55 for our next panel.